Okay. So I know we have some people still probably rolling in. We'll be rolling in for a couple of minutes. That's fine, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, first, a couple of introductions. My name is Irina Bukharin. I am a program director for human security at C4ADS. We will tell you what C4ADS is. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Jake. All right, Jake, that's the part where I introduce you. myself. Yes, that was so cute. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am a software engineer uh, at C4 ADS, uh, and I've worked for the past couple of years on our Icarus flight tracking platform, uh, really exploring the entire space of commercially and publicly available data uh, in the realm of tracking aircraft, identifying aircraft ownership information, um, and building out a pretty cool set of tools uh, that hopefully you all will start using. So I'm excited to talk to you about some of that. Okay, and so with that, I think we can get into it. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about uh, aircraft tracking generally, and then specifically with Icarus Flights, which is a C4DS tool that we've developed um, to sh share with investigators and journalists. Okay. So just a brief overview of what we'll be covering today. We'll do continue the introduction. Uh, we'll give an overview of aircraft tracking, identification, and ownership, general investigative techniques that we can use when a plane appears in our investigation or we're interested in finding more information out about uh, flights. Um, after that, we'll have a couple of exercises that we'll kind of guide you through and show on the screen. We will introduce the Icarus Flights platform, do a few demos, and then with whatever time we have remaining, do a QA. and a um, Also at this point, I'd like to note that we do have a survey that we sent in the Pathable chat, um, which asks if you know, anybody has planes that they're interested in checking out. That's something that we can potentially find time for at the end. Um, or generally, if you have questions, please feel free to send them in the chat and we will be responsive um, either during the presentation or, or try to get to it at the end. Okay, so C4ADS, I think it's helpful to have a little bit of an introduction into what Jake and I do, the organization that we work for. So C4ADS is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. in the United States, and we focus on using publicly available information. So anything that you can either find in the traditional open source or um, data that you can buy. And we combine that with emerging technologies to investigate and disrupt um, transnational illicit networks, as well as investigate broader transnational security challenges. Uh, we position ourselves sort of at the center of the non-governmental sector and the governmental um, space, and that includes working very closely with journalists. So we're really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, as an organization, we focus on connecting our people, as I mentioned, with data and technology. So this uh, includes um, analysts who are multilingual, widely traveled, tech savvy, we're applying data, collecting data from corporate registries, trade data, flight data, as we'll discuss today, um, from basically every country in the world. And we're using a variety of technologies to investigate um, whatever problem we're looking at. Through this work, we attempt to have um, impact on the issues that we're looking at, whether that's taking the form of enforcement actions, such as um, seizures or finance, financial disruptions to supporting journalists in their work or working with civil society organizations to fill some of the gaps in their um, skills and things like that. However, today um, we will be focusing on the flight side of investigations, which is something that uh, Jake has really led the charge um, for at C4ADS, and we're excited to share with you today. Yeah, thank you, Ibrina. Um, With that, I will jump into talking about flight and aircraft data exploration um, and some of the identifiers that we use when we're looking at aircraft. Um, 
and really just some of the most important entry points to aircraft data. So I'll talk about um, different sources of data, um, aircraft transponders, uh, and how you can track aircraft and some of the caveats associated with that. And I will also talk about um, all of the different sources of publicly available information uh, that you can leverage in order to paint a picture of any aircraft that shows up in your investigations. Um, and then we'll talk about Icarus flights uh, and how we're trying to make it easier to bring all of that information into one accessible place. So to start off, there are three main verticals for aircraft data. Uh, that's imagery, ownership information, and flight tracking data. In the case of imagery, um, you all have probably seen pictures of private jets come up on the social media accounts of individuals or organizations that you're investigating. For example, you can see here on the right that there is an aircraft uh, that was seized by the UK's National Crime Agency. Um, and this kind of photo will sometimes show the tail number or the registration number of the aircraft. Once you know that identifier, maybe you know the kind of plane it is, maybe you know what country it's probably registered in, you know what the livery looks like, you can then take that information and start looking for ownership trails for that specific aircraft. Uh, and you might find companies associated with the individual of interest. Uh, you might unravel a web of uh, ultimate beneficial ownership chain uh, that leads you to some new leads. And then you can also track that aircraft. Uh, so if the person that you're interested in, the individual of interest in your investigation is based in one jurisdiction, and you know that they're flying on this private jet and you can track that private jet, given that you know the association between that person and that transportation asset, um, you can see when they go to a new jurisdiction in order to do some sort of business. And then that's a new place for you to continue your investigation. Uh, and it might also mean that that's an opportunity for you or a human source on the ground to go take a picture of that aircraft or to see what else is going on. And, while there's a lot of exciting possibility with each of these data verticals, uh, there are certainly gaps in each of these. Not every country pu uh, publishes ownership information for aircraft. Um, not every plane has a transponder that makes it trackable. Um, but in tandem, each of these verticals together make one very interesting investigative tool that every journalist should have in their toolkit. So I wanna talk about how we track aircraft when they're flying. Um, so aircraft today are equipped with uh, technology called ADS-B. ADS-B uh, and the equipment in the aircraft called the transponder uh, gets the aircraft's location from global navigation satellites like GPS satellites while the aircraft is flying. And the aircraft knows where it is. It knows how fast it's traveling. It knows its altitude. It knows its vertical speed. It knows other information information about its characteristics of flight. And in order to aid in detection, in order to aid in collision prevention uh, with other aircraft flying around in the same airspace, in order to make it easier for air traffic control to monitor airspaces without expensive uh, normal radar technology, uh, ADS-B, a form of secondary surveillance radar technology, has that aircraft, every aircraft, broadcast its location down to the ground uh, every couple of seconds. So what this means is that if you have the right kind of equipment on the ground in order to receive those transmissions, you can pick up aircraft within the airspace above you. And because it's line of sight and the horizon is pretty broad, you can, with the right kind of antenna, pick up aircraft within hundreds of kilometers of the antenna's location. What this means is just a few thousand antennas can cover the entire world um, which is why there are a bunch of open source flight tracking resources that are built out of networks of ground-based receivers that can identify basically where every aircraft that has a transponder is at any moment over the world, um, which is a very powerful tool uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But first I wanna talk about which aircraft have transponders on them so that they become visible in this way. Um, there are increasingly mandates for uh, all aircraft flying within certain countries to have an ADS-B transponder on them. Uh, this technology is a bit over a decade old at this point, uh, as far as its widespread application. 
And so you can see that many countries, uh, including uh, North American countries, Western Europe, a lot of Southeast Asia, um, have ADSB mandates that mean that any aircraft that wants to fly through those countries has to be equipped with this kind of tracking device, this transponder. There are also some countries that are working on implementing these new mandates. Uh, for example, New Zealand is uh, completing their implementation in December. Saudi Arabia, uh, in the next couple of years, Mexico, South Africa, Canada, all have pending regulation uh, that would require the use of ADSB transponders in their airspace. And so slowly, more and more aircraft are being required to have these transponders. But the kind that we're most interested in tracking, uh, for example, the private jet that uh, a, a kleptocratic leader in Africa wants to fly to Geneva uh, for a trip, that because Switzerland has a mandate, um, because Europe itself has a mandate, um, that aircraft will be required to be equipped with this transponder and transmit that information so that we can track it. Uh, and I juxtapose this uh, information on ADSB technology with uh, AIS technology. For any of you who might be familiar with maritime tracking, AIS is very similar to ADSB. And AIS has, is a technology that uh, is very similar because uh, ships have transponders on them. And most ships in the world that are large enough to be interesting are required to have AIS transponders. And adherence to AIS uh, use is pretty universal, uh, except when ships turn them, their transponders off, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so basically, this shows the end state the ADSB is moving towards, where every ship is required to have a transponder because the technology has been around for longer. Uh, pretty soon, every aircraft that wants to fly in most countries will be equipped with a transponder as well because this regulation is increasingly rolling out worldwide. So I mentioned that there are a lot of commercial resources uh, that allow you to track aircraft and to see this aggregated ADSB data. Uh, and so some of these include Icarus Flights, our tool, which pulls data from ADSB Exchange. ADSB Exchange is a network of over 7,000 receivers on the ground, hosted by enthusiasts, by journalists. Uh, I have one uh, hanging in my window right here in Washington, DC. Um, and they take all of the data from receivers distributed around the world uh, and aggregate that into one place and make it searchable. Flight Radar 24, Radar Box, and Flight Aware are some other resources you might have heard of. Um, these are all commercial organizations. So there are some caveats in that they will block aircraft at the owner's request uh, in order to promote privacy. Uh, ADSB Exchange is more transparent and uh, doesn't have the same kind of profit motivation um, or revenue model as it is. Uh, and the same for us, which means that we have a lot more data at our fingertips uh, to use for investigations. Uh, and then this is also to show that there are similar resources in the maritime space, um, which you might all be familiar with to continue this example. So um, you can see a coverage map of ADSB Exchange's global coverage here on the right. Uh, this is a little bit over six months old. Most of the coverage uh, is excellent over North America, over Western Europe. Um, but you can see that there's a need for receivers in uh, parts of South America, uh, a lot of Africa, much of Central Asia. Uh, the areas where we really want to have coverage uh, and where we want to be able to track aircraft in our flights investigations um, in issues like corruption, kleptocracy, trafficking, smuggling, weapons transfers, VIP transport, all of these things happen uh, and touch jurisdictions like North America, Western Europe, um, but are often centered in jurisdictions where we don't have as great coverage which is why we've been working with ADSB Exchange as a part of the Icarus Flights project to deploy more receivers around the world. Uh, and so you can see a picture of the a 3D model for what one of these receivers looks like on the top right. It's the size of about two credit cards. It uses a small microcomputer called a Raspberry Pi uh, and an antenna attached to that. And just one of these antennas, uh, you put it in a window or you mount it on a roof or in an open space like a yard, 
and you can pick up aircraft within hundreds of kilometers of your location. Um, and you just need a Wi-Fi or ethernet connection and a little bit of, bit of electricity. Um, included in the survey that we sent along uh, through Pathable is a link to request a receiver. So if you think that you are in a jurisdiction where uh, the coverage map is not quite so bright, so going back to this slide for a moment, um, we would be very happy to send you a receiver that you can deploy. Uh, and you can learn more about that on the link that we sent in that survey. Um, so that's one of our goals is to increase access to this data um, by increasing the amount of data that people are feeding to ADSP Exchange uh, so that then we can make it more widely available so that we can track aircraft in interesting places and see all of the planes that are now starting to have transponders equipped on them. So I'm going to dive now into some of the most important identifiers that we see when we're looking at aircraft in our investigations. So now that you know about how aircraft tracking works, uh, I wanna talk about some of the specifics of that, um, specifically the identifiers that you need to be familiar with in order to uh, track planes. So the first is the MODES hex code. And the MODES hex code is also called a transponder code. It's also called an ICAO or ICAO code. Um, and you can see two examples of it here, AC1DDC, um, which can be either capitalized or lowercase. It's not specifically important. Um, it's a six digit alphanumeric code um, that identifies a unique aircraft transponder. So when an aircraft is registered in a country, it's issued a transponder code, this MODES hex code, and that transponder code uh, is set in the aircraft's equipment in its electronics. And so anytime that aircraft broadcasts its location and how it's traveling, that hex code is included in those transmissions. And that hex code is uniquely tied to a registration number. Uh, so that's this third vertical here. And the registration number is a string that includes a prefix, which indicates what country the aircraft is registered in and then a suffix, which is the specific information um, or the specific identifier for that aircraft. So in the United States, when aircraft are registered here, they get an N number or is, that's a term uh, that people use to describe a US aircraft registration because it starts with N. So you can see on the top here, I have N12345. That's an example of a valid US registration number for an aircraft. You can also see EIDCK. EI is the prefix for Ireland. Uh, and so that would also be uh, a valid Irish aircraft registration. Uh, in fact, that's a Ryanair aircraft. Um, so the registration number and the MODES hex code are tied together. And when an aircraft changes jurisdictions, when it's re-registered in one country, for example, it's registered in the US one year, it's sold to an Irish buyer like Ryanair, and then it's re-registered in Ireland, the transponder code and the registration number will both change, but the serial number, which is the second vertical here on the aircraft will not change. So the serial number is uniquely uh, identifying every single airframe that is produced um, by an aircraft manufacturer, meaning that the serial number is something you can use to link um, aircraft as they're re-registered because most aircraft are bought or sold several times during their lifetime. And oftentimes these transactions are international. This means that if you're tracking a plane with activity in 2017, you might be looking at an aircraft um, and then expect that that same, um, that same transponder code corresponds to the same aircraft two years later but it's possible that that aircraft was sold to a different country, re-registered with a new transponder code and new registration number, and the country in which it was previously registered, deregistered it and then issued that registration number and transponder code to a new aircraft, um, which is one of the things that makes this tricky. But the serial number will always unify um, so that you can track the same asset across multiple registrations. And finally, uh, very quickly, the call sign is an identifier that the aircraft transponder sends while it's in flight. 
Um, and this can often include information on the operator of the aircraft. So you can see I have two examples here, UAL-22. UAL uh, is the IATA code for United Airlines. Uh, and 22 indicates that it's United Airlines Flight 22. And you can see RYR is Ryanair. Uh, and 96AT would be the flight number. Um, so the call sign is often helpful because it will allow you to guess very quickly at the operator of an aircraft, even if you couldn't find that information elsewhere. So a practical application of this is an investigation that we conducted a couple of years ago where we were looking at videos of Libyan militias and we saw what we thought was a Russian cargo aircraft. And you can see in this YouTube screenshot that there's a red box around uh, the bottom of the wing of this aircraft. Printed on the bottom of the wing is a registration number, we think. So we Googled that registration number and what we found is that a Sigma Airlines lists that aircraft as a part of their fleet. So now we've very quickly gone from just seeing a picture in social media and YouTube and um, identifying more about that aircraft. We now know what kind it is and we know the actual operator of it. And we can continue our investigation into their corporate structure into what they do, who they've worked with. And we also went to an unofficial registration source called russianplanes.net. And we got that just by Googling the registration number and clicking on a different link. And they were even able to tell us more about this aircraft, like the serial number, uh, the year that it was produced. Um, and this is extremely helpful because it means that we have a unique identifier for that aircraft um, and additional information on it. Uh, and this is a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, and so we'll be giving you an example with Prigozhin uh, Prigozhin's aircraft in a few minutes. So I want to talk about that uh, second important vertical in aviation data overall, which is ownership information, um, because it's important in our investigations. It doesn't mean very much if we know that there's a private jet but have no idea who is flying on it and no, have no idea who's operating it. It might go interesting places, but we want to know more. Uh, about the providence of that aircraft. So the availability of aircraft ownership data is admittedly spotty, uh, especially as far as official registries go. Um, all aircraft must be registered somewhere, um, but you can register your private aircraft or your commercial aircraft wherever you want to, uh, for the most part. Um, there are many countries that accept international owners um, in their aircraft registries. And it's kind of like uh, corporate secrecy jurisdictions in a lot of cases. So deciding which country you're going to register your aircraft in might hinge upon whether that country publishes aircraft ownership data. So for example, Aruba has the world's first and only privately run aircraft registry, and they prefix their registrations with P4. Um, and Aruba will not publish your aircraft registration information. Uh, the United States, Canada, France, the UK, Australia, um, and many other countries do have official registries where they publish the owner of most aircraft. Um, but there are secrecy jurisdictions, just like there are with company registrations, um, that mean that you can literally have an offshore aircraft registration. You don't have to be a resident of Aruba in order to pay for their services and to have your aircraft legally registered as far as the Chicago Convention rule is concerned, um, but in a way that means that people won't have an official record of who owns that aircraft. Now, in countries where aircraft registrations uh, are made public and when the ownership information is disclosed, there are still several caveats that mean that you're not always going to be able to identify the ultimate beneficial owner of the aircraft, um, which is unfortunate, but there are ways that we can work around it. A few of the different ways in which organizations get around publishing ultimate beneficial ownership information for aircraft include the use of shell companies, the use of trusts, and the use of leases. So as far as shell companies go, if I'm registering an aircraft in the US and I don't want people to know who owns that aircraft, I'm going to create an LLC, register it in a secrecy jurisdiction, and then register my aircraft to that LLC. Easy, nobody knows my name. Um, 
Another way that I can cleverly do this, uh, even if I'm not a US citizen, which you have to be in order to own an aircraft registered in the US, um, is register my aircraft through a trust or through a leasing corporation. So there's the Bank of Utah Corporation and the Aircraft Leasing Corporation, um, which are both options here, as well as Wells Fargo Bank of North America. So you can see I put a screenshot here of our Icarus Flights tool, and we have a filter that allows us to search on registrant. And I searched for a few different permutations of the name Wells Fargo Bank North America trustee. And you can see that uh, I found over a thousand aircraft that are registered uh, to any permutation of these names. So the gist of this is that there are um, many, there are over a thousand at least, but really many thousands of aircraft that are registered to Wells Fargo Bank NA. And even the United States FAA doesn't always know who the ultimate beneficial owner of those aircraft are. Uh, and so that's a bit troubling as far as the regulations go. Uh, and it does make our investigations a little bit more challenging. Um, so as far as official registry sources go, um, like I said, the US, France, Canada, Australia, UK publish ownership information for aircraft. And they have easy to use searchable interfaces that you can all use in order to pull up official registration information. You can look at aircraft that were registered with a registration number back in history in a lot of these, including in the US. Um, however, there are the caveats that you're not always going to know the ultimate beneficial owner. And also some new aircraft privacy protection programs have been springing up. So for example, in the United States, there's an organization called the National Business Aircraft Association. The NBAA uh, has a program that they created with the FAA um, called limiting aircraft data display. And what that does is it selectively blocks owners who have requested greater privacy protections. It, it blocks their ownership information from appearing in the FAA's public database directly. And it also blocks them from certain data feeds from the FAA, um, which means that flight trackers like FlightAware, if they want to cooperate with the FAA, must not display tracking data that they receive from the FAA on those aircraft, um, which is one of the reasons why you will sometimes not see private jets showing up in commercial flight trackers. It's also one of the reasons why you might not see the kind of ownership information published by the governments directly that you would expect. In order to get around the caveats of official registries and um, censorship of certain information, is uh, unofficial registry sources that are available on the internet. So there are a number of different of ones of these. Uh, for example, a couple of my favorites are RZ Jets and the Open Sky Network. In the case of RZ Jets, RZ Jets uh, is similar to Wikipedia in that anyone can make suggestions and make edits, um, but it's still generally a very solid resource um, for identifying the owners of aircraft, even when that ownership information is not published formally or officially. There are a couple commercial providers as well that do their own research and uh, publish some of this information. That includes the Aero Transport Data Bank and CH Aviation, and they're pretty solid, although they both tend to focus on commercial jets um, rather than smaller private aircraft, which are generally the ones we are interested in in our investigations. Um, so these are all great resources. Just keeping in mind the caveat that um, this information is user curated, so it could be a lead generation tool, but it will be subject to verification later um, because you don't know for sure that this is accurate unless you can find a corroborating source that is solid. Another great resource is plane spotter photos, and there are a couple of large websites that curate um, or that host collections of images. Um, so. Jet Photos has over 3 million images that enthusiasts have submitted. Planespotters.net, I think, has over a million, million and a half. Um, both of these are excellent resources because if you're interested in looking at one aircraft, maybe it's registered in the United States one day and it's registered in France the next. Um, it's possible that it was sold to a different owner and there was a change in its livery. It was repainted. Someone put a vanity logo onto the side of the tail. Uh, we've actually had that exact situation come up in an investigation in the past 
where someone uh, painted their initials onto the tail of this aircraft when they bought it. Uh, and that really helped our investigation. <laughs> Even though ownership information wasn't available, we could tie it to this individual and this company on the basis that that aircraft had um, been repainted and had some identifying information on it, even though it was a private jet. Um, so these are useful and also fun resources. Additionally, we can track military aircraft. Um, so military transports, cargo jets uh, will sometimes have ADSB transponders on them. Um, sometimes you will see military drones, uh, reconnaissance drones, for example, over Syria, we see transmissions from sometimes. We will sometimes see them transmitting data um, over the ADSB exchange network. Um, generally, military aircraft know to turn off their ADSB transponders if they're doing something where they don't want to be detected, or they're just not required to be equipped with them in the first place because they control whatever airspace they're operating in. Uh, you will see military training aircraft oftentimes will have transponders and are interesting to look at uh, on flight tracking websites. Um, and there are some good resources out there on the internet as well, as far as tracking military aircraft. Scramble is one of the best of these. Scramble has both a civil and a military database uh, that you can use. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested, to look at some of these resources uh, and learn more about it. In addition to aircraft ownership databases, there are some other uh, options as far as data um, that include a little bit more information than just ownership. For example, Cameroon doesn't have an ownership registry, but they do have a database of um, aircraft safety information for all of their registered aircraft, um, which could be a useful data source if you're operating in that jurisdiction. Uh, additionally, this is a fun data set called Geneva Airport Movement Inquiries, and it includes a live updating catalog of all of the aircraft that arrive or depart Geneva Airport, um, which is always interesting because many of the kleptocrats of the world will stop over in Geneva for a vacation, for fuel, um, what have you. Um, and so you can see their aircraft showing up here even if they're for some reason not available on a flight tracker. Another great resource is Twitter. So I included a few tweets from uh, individuals that I follow here, Stefan Watkins, Avi Sharf, Gerjan, who do excellent research and regularly tweet about uh, interesting aircraft that they see flying. So interesting aircraft and interesting flights are pretty much any flights that are not normal commercial scheduled passenger or cargo flights. Um, so that means if there is a charter flight, even if it's operated um, by an airline, that they will often flag that as something interesting. Maybe there's an, a 747 flying from Iran, stopping over in Tunisia and flying on to Venezuela, which has happened. Um, that's an interesting thing uh, to see uh, an Iranian cargo aircraft conducting that activity. And so they will flag something like that. Maybe there's a military aircraft flying from Turkey to Libya. Um, they will often flag that. So if you're really interested in this, uh, this is always a good source of lead generation um, because these people are really on top of uh, this research. And it's just very interesting uh, to keep up to date with all of the planes of the world that are doing things that are a little bit questionable uh, and could always be dug a little bit deeper into. There are also aggregators of some of that research um, that a lot of Twitter enthusiasts put out. Um, and so one example of this is liveuamap.com, which I uh, just recently discovered, which includes not only events when aircraft of interest are operating in your jurisdiction of interest, but also on um, other important events happening that are pulled largely from Twitter and then geolocated and put on the map to uh, relevant locations, as you can see in this screenshot here. Another one of these is this resource that I just found, this uh, flight watch um, at dukas.net. This uh, includes call signs, registration numbers, origins and destinations for interesting aircraft, those same kind of flights that I was just talking about 
that are unusual in some way that would, might be of interest to us uh, and accounts of um, what the open source community has been able to figure out uh, for those flights. So also a recommendation uh, for you all to check that out and follow if you're interested. So um, I would like to give you all a chance to ask a couple of questions and then we'll do a practical um, uh, investigation using some of the information we now have about aircraft identifiers. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and see if you have any questions, feel free to um, post them now uh, and I can answer them just in case there's anything that is unclear as far as aircraft identifiers and some of these data uh, sources. So I'll go ahead and give like 30 seconds uh, for any questions you all have. And uh, in the meantime, um, we're gonna do two challenges uh, for looking at Yevgeny Prigozhin's uh, aircraft. So he's Putin's chef, uh, as has been reported in some interesting investigations by OCCRP, by a lot of interesting uh, independent journalists by C4ADS in the past as well. Um, and so, uh, him and his family are very notorious uh, for their business empire and operate a number of private jets. Uh, and the tail numbers of these aircraft have been reported. Um, so the goal here is to go find some of them. So we're gonna walk through two of them. Um, so if you do uh, have a web browser open, just start searching uh, and I'll give you all a minute to come up with some uh, of those tail numbers. There should be, at least three of these aircraft of interest. And if you want to direct message them to me within Zoom, um, then I'll know that you found the answers. Uh, so I'll just give you all a minute for this and then I will walk through how I found those uh, tail numbers. Yeah, so uh, I'll just answer Elizabeth Thompson's question here. Um, so the question is, so can your service track aircraft that have asked other sites like FlightAware to block their movements? Uh, I ran into that after I did a story on someone with a private jet registered first in Bermuda, then with the US Aircraft Trust. Suddenly I could no longer track their movements. So uh, yes, we can. Um, so ADSB Exchange, which is the source of data for Icarus flights, um, does not censor any aircraft um, tracking information. And so, um, and so neither does Icarus flights. And that's because this information is collected by our own network of receivers, meaning that it's not provided to us by anyone. It's literally connected for, or it's collected for free over the airwaves. Um, so because it's available publicly, um, ADSB Exchange and ourselves have no obligation to censor this. Um, my understanding is that many of the commercial flight trackers like FlightAware uh, block aircraft because they are commercial enterprises and they have a business model predicated on charging um, aircraft owners in order to protect their privacy, um, which is an obligation that we don't have. And we're very glad that we don't. So um, great, this is a couple of other uh, registration numbers for aircraft associated with progression. Um, and so I'll jump into this next part here. Um, now that you have found some leads, uh, this is one of them, BPCSP. Um, so I'd like everyone to research what country VPCSP is registered in and the current status of its registration. Um, so whether it's active, whether it's been changed, um, and no need to post your answers in the chat for this one for, from now on, we'll, we'll keep it all secret so that it can remain a surprise. Uh, I'll give you all about 45 seconds here uh, to answer these two questions and then I'll explain uh, how we can do that. Yeah, so I'll answer this question that just came in from Patricia. Um, so she wrote, uh, in the case of Venezuela, we have tried to track several airplanes, but apparently they turned off the transponder and it is not possible to follow the trail. Or some sources tell us that the antennas at the airports do not work and the track is also lost. Have you had any experience with flights from Venezuela? If they turn off the transponder, is there any way to get the track? So a few different things here. Um, 
there are reports of aircraft deliberately turning off their transponder. Um, but the more likely case is usually that the aircraft have fallen out of the coverage network of ADSB, uh, depending on which flight tracking network you're using, whether that's Flight Radar 24, ADSB Exchange, Icarus flights via ADSB Exchange. Um, those networks uh, have limited coverage over Venezuela, so you might see an aircraft fly flying around Caracas, but anywhere else within the country, there uh, just might not be receivers on the ground. And since the coverage of one receiver is pretty great, a couple hundred kilometers, uh, but still limited if there are only a couple of receivers within a given country, um, sometimes aircraft will just fall out of range. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the transponder has been deliberately disabled. Uh, and, and unfortunately, in those cases, um, that means that we're not able to track those aircraft. Um, so the best thing that we can do is find willing receiver hosts in areas um, where we want to have better coverage. Uh, and we have funding to send out receivers um, for free in areas where we don't currently have very good coverage uh, and add those to the ADSB exchange network. Um, so that's the simple answer, basically. Um, the good news is that when aircraft fly between jurisdictions uh, across the ocean, they will often fall out of our terrestrial coverage network, uh, and then maybe they're flying over the Atlantic and then end up in Africa. If we have a receiver in Venezuela and we have a receiver in Africa where that plane comes back into view, we will be able to put those two segments of the flight together, even though we weren't able to see the aircraft crossing the Atlantic because we don't have receivers in the water. Um, as an example of how, even though there are gaps, you can oftentimes make sense of this data anyways. Um, Andy Rizza writes, can we track the plane routes 10 years ago? What are the challenges for doing that? Um, so we're going to be talking about the Icarus flights tool in a moment um, and what kind of data we have within it. Uh, ADSB exchanges archives for historical data go back to mid 2016. And the Icarus flights platform has data searchable from the beginning of 2019 to present. Um, so the short answer is that I don't know of any uh, flight tracking resource um, that has information going back and is searchable uh, for a 10 year time span. Uh, and the best we can do is about the past five years for ADSB exchange, uh, at least as far as what we have access to, um, what I know of out there that is publicly available. So I'm gonna jump back to this investigation. Um, and I hope that answers your questions. I'm happy to uh, respond to follow-ups as well in a few minutes here. Um, so the questions are VPCSP, where is it registered and what is the status of its registration? So I'm gonna show you a little screen share video that I pre-recorded here just for ease um, in which you can see I'm Googling VPCSP but I need to know what country it's registered in if I wanna find the official registration information. So I'm pulling up one of my favorite resources, this Wikipedia article on list of aircraft country registration prefixes. We find VP-C corresponds to the Cayman Islands, um, not to be confused with VP-B. Uh, and so now I can pull up the official Cayman Islands aircraft registry if it exists. So I click the active aircraft register. It does exist, it is public. It includes ownership information. They structured it as a PDF so that it's hard for us to conduct analysis on. Um, but I didn't find the aircraft. I did not find VPCSP. So what I'm doing is using a little bit of advanced Googling and I found that Google indexed an older version of the registry published on that uh, official aircraft registry's website. And this one is from 2015, from January of 2015. And you can see that VPCSP was registered in January of 2015, according to the official Cayman registry. And you can see the type of the aircraft and the serial number associated with it. Uh, and also the registered owner, which is a company called Springline. Um, so we know that as of um, January uh, 2015, uh, this aircraft had been registered for the past uh, 10 years. Uh, it was first registered in February of 2005 in the Cayman Islands. Um, and we also know the serial number of this aircraft. 
However, we know that it's not currently registered in the Cayman Islands. So that begs the question, where is it registered now? And how can we figure that out? So I'm gonna jump to this. Uh, so your next challenge, which I'll give you about 60 seconds to complete, is to determine where that aircraft is now registered uh, and what its current registration number is. So remember the serial number of the aircraft and the type of aircraft will not change uh, when it's re-registered in a different jurisdiction, uh, whatever that is. Uh, so you should be able to use that in order to aid in your search. Okay, so I hope you all found some answers here uh, as to where that plane went um, and where it is currently. And so I'm just gonna quickly show you um, uh, how I figured that out based on its serial number. Um, so I'm searching for Beechcraft and then uh, the serial number of this aircraft um, because serial numbers are not always unique across different manufacturers. There might be a Cessna aircraft that was manufactured that has the same serial number, unlikely but possible. Um, so I pulled up an unofficial registry and I found that it is registered in Russia, RA0731, which I think someone actually posted in the chat as an answer to one of the previous questions as a Prigozhin associated aircraft. So that's great. Um, I found by searching for it in Russian language, the official Russian aircraft registry and I downloaded a CSV of that. And then I went into the official Russian aircraft registry uh, using this very good CSV analysis tool called TAD that's open source uh, that I definitely recommend uh, if you struggle with Excel. Um, and so I type in the serial number and I filter down to columns where the serial number contains 258. And we know the serial number of the aircraft that used to be registered in the Caymans is 258210. And it's a Hawker Beechcraft 125. And you can see that the official registration number is zero two, RA02731. And that um, it is currently active. It is actively registered within Russia right now. Um, so we've successfully gone from uh, the aircraft's previous registration number and it's a finding its official registration for when it was registered in the Caymans to identifying where that aircraft moved to where it's currently registered, um, meaning that we can track both its old and its new identities. And they're, it's the same aircraft uh, likely still associated with Progosian's activities. So just very quickly, uh, I wanna show you another aircraft associated with Progosian uh, that was seen. Uh, so this is a Russian news site uh, that posted an investigation where they used some social media. Um, and so uh, you can see uh, they're looking at the, the profile of Paulina Prigozhina, um, and she posted a picture of their private jet. And you can see the registration number on the engine there. It's M-VITO, M-VITO, um, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to challenge you all to uh, conduct this investigation yourselves, but I do want to quickly run through it because it's another good example of uh, open aircraft registration information. So I typed uh, aircraft registration prefix lookup again to see what, what country M corresponds to. I find that M indicates that the aircraft is registered in the Isle of Man. I go to the official Isle of Man aircraft registry. Um, and I hope that one exists, and it seems like it does. And they provide a very helpful interface uh, on their site that allows me to search on the registration number, the serial number, the owners themselves, the manufacturer. Uh, and I find that M Vito was registered uh, in the Isle of Man, but it's since been deregistered um, as of April 2019. Earlier, we showed you that these aircraft, M Vito and VPCSP, were the target of uh, US sanctions. Uh, that were published by the U.S. Department of Treasury in uh, 2019. So this deregistration and transfer of this aircraft to Russian registration is likely a direct result of that sanctions enforcement action. Uh, and you can see that uh, the Isle of Man also helpfully tells us that it was re-registered in the Russian Federation. So if I go back to the Russian registry, I will find that this same, this additional Prigozhin associated aircraft is also re-registered there.
So, um, Irina, do you want to talk a bit about Icarus Flights? I would love to. Thank you, Jake. Um, okay, so we've talked a bit about general investigative strategies and tools for flight investigations. Now we're going to move to talking about Icarus, which is C4ADS's um, home-built flight tracking platform. In the course of all the flight investigations we've done over the past many years, we sort of came to the conclusion that the current platforms out there were not working for us, and we built our own. Uh, we built it specifically for investigators and journalists like ourselves to address sort of the more investigative type of flight tracking um, needs that we have. Um, some of the key functionalities of the platform include live global tracking, unfiltered results, historical search, um, an activities-based rule engine, and additional, some additional analytical features, all of which I will get into momentarily. Okay, so Jake has referenced this before, but a key feature or a key sort of bug that is also a feature of many commercial um, flight tracking databases is that certain planes are hidden from public view because the owner through one way or another has managed to basically pay off um, the provider from showing it to the users. Of course, those are the planes that we're most interested in looking at. Um, so as Jake mentioned, Icarus provides completely unfiltered results. Um, you can see here in a comparison, we have this plane, it's Venezuelan, it's linked to a uh, corruption case and is actually a sanctioned flight. If we check flight radar 24, sorry, no results. If we move over to the ADSB data that um, Icarus is collecting, here we see a flight from Ecuador to Miami. Of course, this is a sanctioned plane, so that's we already have the start of an investigation right there. Um, another, I think, really interesting element of Icarus is that we're not limited to looking at specific planes that we look at in the search bar, we also have a location-based search capability. So this means you don't have to have a certain plane in mind. You can look at areas of interest to guide your search. So if you're interested in a particular journey, for example, um, we've looked at a, a case that I think you can find on our blog between uh, flights between Turkey and Libya. That was done through an uh, area of interest search in which we looked for planes going between Turkey and Libya and found some really interesting flights. This is helpful because it means you can generate leads in addition to following up on specific plane identifiers that you're already aware of. Um, a few other options that are helpful on Icarus, and Jake is about to do a live demo as well to sort of make this all make sense, but you can do batch aircraft monitoring. So looking at multiple planes at once, uh, you can sort of compare and contrast their patterns of activities. You can also create an alert system either based on aircraft or a certain set of rules in which you get a um, text or email anytime those rules are triggered, which is really helpful if you are sort of actively tracking a flight, individual company, so on. Finally, You've put all this work into your, thank you, Jake. Um, you've put all this work into your investigations and you can save those searches so you're not repeating them every single time, but can just get straight to the juicy stuff. Um, and that is it. Let's move over to the demo. Yeah, so I will very quickly jump in and show you some of the key features that Irina has talked about in the Icarus Flights platform uh, in my web browser here and that Irina will do uh, one or two quick demo investigations that show off some of the capability of this tool, um, which is very powerful. Um, so let me switch over to my web browser here. Um, um, okay, yes. so assuming, excuse me, that everyone can see Icarus flights up on my screen here. Um, this is the beginning point for the platform. Um, it pulls in data live from ADSB Exchange, so you can see 
at any given time aircraft that are in the air. For example, over here uh, where I'm based in DC, I can see a couple of aircraft flying here at 75, 225 feet. Um, so might have just landed or were coming in for landing. Um, I can see the recent path uh, where they've been flying. I can hover over individual points uh, that describe how they were flying, what speed they were traveling at, and some of those other identifiers we talked about before, like the call sign, which uh, in this case shows the registration number for the aircraft, the altitude, the vertical speed, the transponder code. Um, I can also search historical flights for this aircraft at a glance. I can view and see if there's any registration information within Icarus, because our goal was to make this a one-stop shop for aircraft registration information and for flight tracking data, meaning that we pull in both official and unofficial uh, sources of registration data. And we created these registration cards that reflect that. So you can see that this is a registration for this registration number N507ME um, that is official from the US FAA, it's marked as official. And it shows that this is a medevac aircraft registered to the Center for Emergency Medicine of Western Pennsylvania. You can also see that we pulled in an unofficial registration. Sometimes these are the only available um, links to ownership for aircraft that are registered in secrecy jurisdictions or when ownership info is blocked. Uh, and so this is from the Open Sky Network and it is marked unofficial. Um, if there were photos available for this aircraft on planespotters.net, you would be able to see them here. You can search historical transponder data to see flights of this aircraft over the past um, any period of time, really. Um, we also built in a powerful set of features that allow you to get alerts on aircraft and flights of interest to you. So for example, let's say I want all of the aircraft that depart from um, Andrews Air Force Base to send me an alert via text or email. I have an area of interest called Joint Base Andrews that I created within the platform earlier. And I can say origin location. Um, and then I can add additional qualifiers. Maybe I only want to see um, when Air Force One flies out of Andrews. So I can set this to be um, a specific model of the 747, um, which uh, would help me filter down to just Air Force One or maybe I want to um, only look at flights that originated at Joint Base Andrews and end up in Delaware, uh, like Joe Biden is flying home on Air Force One for the weekend. Um, I can create that and then I can receive either immediate or a regular digest of email or text alerts on that basis. Um, so what this is, is it means you don't have to know exactly what aircraft you're looking for in order to search for them in the platform. Um, you can create patterns of behavior and look for aircraft that are doing those interesting things. So if I'm interested in aircraft that are flying over a conflict zone, I can ask for flights through that specific geography. If I'm interested in aircraft that fly through a conflict zone uh, and um, some other place, I can and these search terms together. Um, so this is a very powerful tool uh, and just as you can create alerts on any of these criteria, you can also search for flights or aircraft in the advanced search tool using that same set of criteria. Um, you can also save lists of aircraft within your account in Icarus, um, and you can create custom areas of interest. For example, at one point or another, I created a West Africa area of interest um, because I wanted to cast a very wide net for a potential pattern of behavior. And I just drew that here on the map. And then I could instantly use it in my searches in advanced search uh, to find aircraft that flew from that jurisdiction to that jurisdiction or through that jurisdiction. Um, so if, um, if you go into the link that we provided in Pathable and also in the Zoom chat here, uh, you can sign up to get on our waiting list for Icarus flights. We're rolling out access to journalists and investigators uh, slowly since we're a smaller team um, and there are constraints on how many people can be using the platform at once, of course, as we continue to scale it up and improve it. Um, but we're very excited about the capability that we have already uh, and I'll uh, bring it back to Irina so that she can show us um, an investigation that highlights some of that. Sure. 
Um, thank you, Jake. I know also we are starting to run up against time. So if people have questions, feel free to submit those um, in the chat and we can maybe Jake can start looking at them while I talk through this sort of mini investigation just to give you a sense of what um, using Icarus could look like or using another platform um, as you conduct some sort of flights investigation. Okay, so here we have uh, Jack Ma, one of the most famous um, businessmen in China. Um, and we have a article here from the Financial Times about um, his private jet trips around China and how basically these trips can give you some insight into his business activities. So I'm interested, I wanna see maybe there's something that isn't being covered in this article that we can figure out. So I'm gonna do a very basic search in Google to see, can I find this private jet of Jack Moss? Luckily in this case, um, we have a pretty promising lead right here in the second result, um, potential jet registration of VP. Uh, CZM. Um, of course, I should be doing due diligence for the sake of this investigation. I will not be. I'm going to copy, paste it into Icarus flights and see what we can find. Okay, so we do have a result here of an aircraft with the registration VP um, CZM. I'm going to look at the past six months or so to see what this plane has been up to. Uh, right now it's been set to the past week, feels a bit restrictive. Um, so we'll look through May to November. Icarus is doing its thing and here we go. Some flights in China, quite similar to what we saw um, in the Financial Times article, but interestingly, and hopefully, yes, if you look over at the other side of the world, we also see some flights going um, to New York. Um, looks like maybe the Adirondacks in upstate New York, as well as to San Diego. Um, San Diego is kind of interesting. If we had time, we could go look up what Jack Ma is doing in San Diego. It looks like he has a very close associate that is based in San Diego, and that's something that we could continue to further investigate alongside these um, Chinese flights that were highlighted by the Financial Times article. Um, so that is just a very brief look at practically what an Icarus flights investigation would look like. Um, given the time, I think we can switch over to questions, Jake, if that makes sense, or I, I'm happy to do another little demo. Yeah, for sure. I think it would be good to do another quick demo. Um, we can uh, wait for a few more questions. I see one in the chat right now. But, um, feel free to post your questions. Um, but uh, yeah, Irina, I think it would be helpful to do a little bit more. Okay, sounds good. I will. So in the interest of time, while you're working on that, I can uh, go ahead and answer uh, one of the questions posted here, which is, can we get a whole list of data like a CSV by setting up the alerts? Um, or can we only, sorry, lost the chat as the screen share came up. Um, or can we only, uh, can we get a whole list of data like a CSV by setting up the alerts, or can we only get the notification every single time when the targeted aircraft fall in the area that I'm interested in? Thanks. Um, so the answer is that uh, Icarus Flights has an export tool. So whenever you conduct a search, uh, there's an option to export all of the flights uh, that match your search results, and also to export the individual position reports within each of those flights. Um, so if you get an alert, then you can uh, go back into the Icarus platform, look at the results for that alert and click export as CSV. Uh, and then you'll get those results uh, in a form that you can analyze elsewhere. Okay, 
Um, as new questions come in, I'll just cover this quickly as well. Here's another article from the Daily Telegraph. Um, so interesting source, but we might still be able to get something from it. Um, and the main point of the article is that Crown Resorts has bought these new planes. Um, and you know, they're gonna be shipping VIPs around Asia in particular um, between Australia and Asia, but also potentially elsewhere in the globe. So we're interested and Jake, feel free to interrupt me if, if questions seem more pressing, I can't see what they are. Um, but from here, we know that these uh, planes are registered in Australia. So I will quickly move to the Australian corporate registry, which is somewhat friendly and has um, a basic keyword search. So I'm gonna search for Crown, which is associated with the um, Crown Resort's name, of course. Um, some of these look a little bit less promising, but then we have Crown Melbourne pop up. We assume I've done my due diligence. I've confirmed that Crown Melbourne is in fact associated with Crown Resorts. And suddenly I have um, these three planes show up. I can take this code, um, which is the last three digits. So we need to add the VH to the front of it. Pop over to Icarus. And once again, see what's going on. And Here another we... note here is that, so Irina went the long way around in doing this, but you could also search the ownership information in Icarus. So if Irina types Crown Melbourne into that top search bar, um, the results will show us uh, any aircraft registered to Crown Melbourne, um, which is very powerful as far as search tools go. Um, so she's going to show us some of the interesting flights by this uh, aircraft associated with a casino carrying lots of high rollers um, near uh, the Asian Pacific region. Uh, I'm going to answer the last couple of questions before we run out of time. Um, so uh, Jack Kerr asks, can Icarus or any other tool show you all flights from an airport? Um, yes, it can. So if you search for that airport in that top search bar, um, you will uh, get results matching on the name. So if I type SFO, I'll get San Francisco Airport. Uh, and then I can click um, look for all of the arrivals or all of the departures from that airport. Um, Emma James uh, is asking about the rollout uh, and whether there are requirements that you have to meet to get access. Uh, and whether Icarus will be available openly at any point. Um, and the answer is that um, we're working on improving Icarus uh, and uh, rolling it out to as many people as we can, as quickly as we can, while still um, making sure that uh, we're working with our partners who are getting access um, and that we can keep up with that. So we're rolling out at the pace of a few uh, logins for Icarus per week at this point. We'll be ramping that up soon. Um, the answer is that we're focusing on independent um, journalists and um, uh, really capacity building for um, investigators who work with nonprofits. Um, and um, basically, th those organizations and individuals that share a common mission to C4ADS. Um, so that doesn't mean we're not providing access to larger media organizations. Um, but it does mean that our priority is, um, is getting access to everyone in an equitable way at this point, uh, which is why that we're, we have a waiting list that's running. Um, and there's more information about all of that uh, in the link that we provided in Pathable. Um, quickly here, answering Elizabeth Thompson's question. Um, so is it possible to see that the plane Jack Ma often uses has gone to Vermont? So it is possible to see that Jack Ma's plane goes to Vermont or upstate New York, but there's no way of knowing who's on the plane. Could it have been someone else from his company? The answer is yes, it could absolutely have been someone else from his company. Um, unfortunately, without any additional information, we have to speculate um, a little bit about who is on that aircraft. Uh, if you were lucky, you could have a human source on the ground that is able to 
uh, see who got on or off of that plane or find some other information, like maybe some media reporting about an event that Jack Ma was attending in that jurisdiction. Um, but uh, there is no way to know who was on the plane other than those sorts of means, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Well, um, that is the last of the questions and we're at time. So thank you all very much um, for listening. Um, it's always fun to talk about aircraft and flight investigations. Um, and yeah, uh, I hope that we can roll out access to Icarus to many of you and that you can use it in creating great, interesting investigative journalism, uh, making the world more transparent uh, along the way. And we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, later as well. If you want, uh, I believe our contact information is available in Pathable. Um, you can find me on Twitter um, and you can get in touch with either of us at any point in the future. So thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your, whatever time period you're in, in your time zone. Absolutely. Yeah, I echo everything Jake said. Thank you all for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference and please do stay in touch. We love to um, meet, talk to, and, and work with other enthusiasts and um, journalists at large. <laughs>